Welcome to the craft and biz of acting, the place to go to learn what they didn't teach you in acting school. When you're looking for the next step in your acting career, we've got you covered. With your host, monologue expert and founder of monologues2go.com, Joyce Story. Hello, fellow thespians. You are listening to the craft and biz of acting. I'm your host, Joyce Story, and we're here to explore the nuts and bolts of auditioning and performing. Today's guest is one of our most prolific monologues to go writers. Elisa Murray is an actress and writer based in Los Angeles and originally from Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Recent film credits include The Education of a Negro, I Am Homicide, Living for the Sacrifice, The Substitute, and Scratch. Elisa trained in New York City and performed in the off-Broadway shows Ten Ways on a Gun and NOLA and the NAACP winning play directed by Leigh and Gray, The Girls of Summer. She had her Los Angeles theater debut at the Stella Adler Theater in the world premiere of The Daughters of Cush by George Corbin, a story about a Caucasian college girl desiring to pledge an historically African-American sorority in 1963. Theaterspokenhere.blogspot described her performance saying, Alisa Murray is a poignant Rhonda. Alisa recently performed in Town Street Theater's 10-minute play festival in the festival winner Sabrina's Christenings and in response, Year of the Woman portraying multiple characters. She also performed in the Visions Theater Festival in Lowdown Country. She is a WGA registered screenwriter of Trapped and In the Name of the Father and the comedic pilot, Coasting. You can find out more about Elisa at imdb.com. Welcome to the show, Elisa. Hi, Joy. So happy to be here. So I'm really excited to have you on the show. You are one of our most sought-after writers at our Monologues to Go community. I mean, a lot of your monologues mm -hmm. are very, very popular. But mm -hmm. you wrote one called Angry Black Woman. Yes. <laughs> it was actually the first one I wrote ever. Really? To, yeah, it was uh, my first attempt. And it was, it's funny how, how it came about, actually. It was um, at the time I was participating in a um, monologue competition group that would, f would do these monologue competitions a couple times a year for different managers and agents in the New York area. And the whole point was for you to go perform a monologue on stage that really showcases your personality and your type. And basically let a manager agent know this is the exact type that I'm looking for for my roster. And then they had like a 75% success rate as far as getting um, unsigned or unrepresented actors with talent managers and agents. And so I did it a couple of times and they had a database of monologues. And most of the monologues, you know, just di I didn't feel like they really fit my type. A lot of them were, you know, you could tell were written for a certain type of girl that wasn't me, a lot of them didn't center around ethnicity. And you would have a very diverse group basically kind of doing the same monologues and trying to make it their own or really kind of performing it not in their own type. For example, there was a couple monologues that were obviously written for a Southern Bell and you can make a Southern Bell anything, but it's like certain specifics in the text were clearly written for maybe a Caucasian woman. And so when you performed it as an African-American or a Latino woman, you had to downplay a lot of your own cultural, a lot of your own cultural like uh, specificities, basically, to make the monologue funny. And I just thought, well, that's not really fair because we have some funny stuff going on within our own cultures that um, is what the agent is probably looking for because the type of parts we're going to go out for are based off of what we look like. So I thought, let me write a monologue for myself this year and just kind of see how it goes. And so that's how I came up with, you know, angry black woman, because it's sort of a stereotype and a play on what sometimes black women are referred to. And it is a negative, but it's like, let's try to turn it into a positive and make you laugh at yourself and make other people laugh with you. And it just ended up being pretty successful. And I do believe when I did this monologue originally, I did end up with an agent um, that year because it was like I was able to finally showcase my type. And I think that that's why people gravitated towards my work. And then from there, it, it snowballed and I started to write different pieces for not only specific ethnic types, but with that in mind in some of the um, monologues, but also specific age types, whether it's the young college student or the older male 
I'm just trying to think of more specific types that weren't so much the girl next door, which is overly written for already. Right. Well, that's really interesting that it was your very first one and you hit such a home run with it. I mean, we sold it this week. I think I emailed you. We sold this week to someone in South Africa. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's amazing. It's amazing that it's it's reached that far. Um, I've gotten a lot of response from that monologue where people have written to me saying that just thank you that they were able to find a monologue that related to them. And that's really all I wanted to do because to me it was, it, I did feel like there was a void because you, you look for monologues and sometimes as, a, as an actress of color, you, you have your greats, you know, Raisin in the Sun and uh, for color girls that you can go to. But when it comes to comedy, there is, I, I just noticed there was like a limitation. And I just thought, oh, let's, let's make a monologue that is obviously written for a woman of color so that she can feel empowered when she, when she reads it by a woman of color. And I'm just glad it had that kind of response because it was, it was really important for me to, to add that to the, the marketplace, if you will. Well, that's the feedback that I get from that monologue as well. People write to me or they write to info at monologues to go.com and they say, thank you so much for this monologue. I have been looking for something that really is me, that really works for me ethnically. And it also shows the things that I can bring to the table. Have you seen this performed a lot by different people? Yes, I have seen this perform, which is amazing. I've actually gone to a couple monologue competitions when I was still based in New York just to see this perform. It, it does do well. I've seen people either get to their finalist or win from this amongst the others that I've written. It is always interesting to see someone else's partake on it. No one ever does it the same way. No one ever does it the way that I envisioned it, yeah. which is always really cool. That's what um, I was going to ask you is, are they very different takes than you have envisioned? Yeah, absolutely. Because everyone has their own sense of identity that they bring into the work. So no actor really does anything the same way, even if they're talking about the same subject matter. So that's always fun to see. You know, some people take it more on a serious note. Some people make it really, really silly. Some people go all out and enthusiastic. Some people are more um, sarcastic. It, I've seen and performed it at least like maybe four times. And each time it's been, it's been very, very different and all good, you know, yeah. all good. It's neat to see as a writer, because I've had that experience too, watching people perform things that I've written, and I hadn't thought of that particular take on something. That is true. It does make you rethink how you would have written it or how you would have performed it yourself. Or sometimes, you know, people take creative license and they take certain things out or they add little things in. And um, it always makes you, you know, look at it again as a writer and say, oh, that's interesting. I, I really like that. I think the, the most... My favorite performance of it, and I, and I don't want to say the actor's name wrong, so I'm not going to say it at all, but I just remember them having an accent. They weren't from America. I believe they were also based out of Africa, you know, an immigrant that had moved in and been living here. And so their partake on it was the, probably the most different uh -huh. um, just because of their own cultural aspects that they brought into it. So once you told me that it also made it all the way to a competition in South Africa as well, and someone had bought it for there just a couple of weeks ago, I was just like, oh, yes, I want to see that footage of that, too, because I think that that's just a very drastic different, you know, being an American person of color versus being a person of color from a different place. It's you're going to have a different perception on how you're going to to read the monologue. But it's all funny. It's all it, I guess I've never seen it perform where it didn't end up getting laughs. It didn't end up getting a good audience response. So it's a really good piece as far as that. Right. As we talk about it, I'm realizing for our audience, we should probably read it <laughs> so that they know oh, yeah. what we're talking yeah. about. Do you want to? <laughs> now, I don't want you to read the whole thing because these are monologues that are for sale. So I don't mm -hmm. want to have any maybe spoilers on the way it ends up. But do you want to read maybe the first half or maybe up to the part about Tyrone, wherever you feel? Yeah. Like OK. OK. Don't assume I'm angry just because I'm a black woman. We're not that angry. We're just Misunderstood. I mean, we do have our reasons to be angry. Hello, have you seen this hair? Like, God, what is this punishment? Was slavery not enough? Do you know how much money a black woman spends on a weave? Honey, a lot. White women get to just <laughs> swing their hair all day long for free. And they think we don't know that they're doing that out of spite. Oh, we know. It's okay. 
because everyone knows once you go black, you don't go back. The darker the berry, the sweeter the juice. We got the natural tan. And of course, black don't crack. But who wants to wait until they're 50 just to say, don't you wish you were black now? It's so unfair. From now on, I'm only speaking in a Caucasian tone. For example, in my black voice, I'll say, Tyrone, you ain't nothing. I can't stand you. But in my Caucasian tone, I'll say, Tyrone, you're not living up to your potential. I really can't stand your personality right now. I'm saying the same thing, right? And then we'll stop it right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was fantastic. I have never heard you read that monologue. I've seen so many other people perform it, but I've never seen you do it. It's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. And Thank I you. love that you're so in your bones about it. You know, there's a real sense of honesty. This monologue, amongst some of the others that I submitted to Monologues to Go and that are available there for purchase, I wanted to kind of have as part of a series called Stereotypes because it was really important for me to kind of blow up those negative stereotypes that are associated on both ends of the spectrum. Because in this monologue, you have stereotypes for, you know, the woman of color and then also stereotypes for the non-woman of color. So I kind of wanted this to be performed in front of diverse audiences so everyone can learn to laugh at these stereotypes to realize how ridiculous they really are. And then also kind of get into the mindset of, you know, an, an African-American woman and then realize that this is funny. The fact that these stereotypes exist, the whole angry Black woman thing is a completely unbased um, stereotype and belief. And like, let's laugh at it. And then let's also laugh at some of the things that we, we think. And let's also explore and really acknowledge some of the things that are great about being a woman of color. So if you did ever feel a little intimidated by the stereotypes that exist within society, you can kind of, you know, use this monologue as a chance to kind of say, yeah, the darker the berry, the sweeter the juice. And yeah, black don't crack and really celebrate some of those aspects of our culture, which maybe aren't celebrated so much. And so that's, that's really what was important to me and with every other piece that I've written is to find a point in it where you can really celebrate your type because your type is who you are, you know what I mean? And a lot of times people don't realize is when you have, you have a lack of pieces available to you that showcase your type, it also makes you feel less than. It makes you feel like, oh, you're not represented. And that's changed so much since this, came about because this monologue is, is came about quite a while ago and, and you see uh, all types of cultures represented now in the media and within television series. But at the time, you know, it, it was important for me to not feel less than and just to make sure that other people felt like, oh, here's a monologue written for me, you know, by me, by someone that looks like me. And that really makes you feel empowered. And that for me was, I think, the most important part about writing it. And that's the response I feel like I get from someone, even though it's just, you know, a quick two minute monologue. It's just the fact that if I'm looking for a monologue for a competition and every monologue, I'm feeling like I have to fit to me, change it up because it wasn't written for me. It starts to make you feel a little like less than a little bit. It makes you feel like I'm not I don't belong here. And then when you do find something that is written exactly for you, then it makes you feel empowered again. And it's just like, oh, this is perfect. This was written with me in mind. And that's just that's just kind of how I wanted to write all of my pieces with someone specific in mind that you don't that maybe doesn't get that kind of attention. Right. Or didn't get that kind of attention at that time. Well, I think that one of the reasons that your monologues sell so well is because of the honesty of the monologues. It's the humanity in them. Yeah. So as a person looking to get the perfect monologue, what are the elements in a monologue that you think you should look for? What is it that makes that great monologue? I think that every great comedic monologue definitely has a punchline. Um, most monologues I see fall flat, fail to have a real punch at the end, it needs to be something that sums it all together. And if there is something controversial in your humor, by the time you get to the end of the monologue, as you will see with this one, if you, if you do purchase it, is that by the end of it, it's like we're saying what we dislike about something, we're, we're voicing our concerns, but we come to a foreground at the end where we can all agree on one thing. And that's what you want the audience to feel like. You don't want them to feel attacked. You don't want them to feel like they're not in on your party. You want them to feel like at the end they got their own special invite and that they understand you. I feel like honesty is important. You want to be honest and um, brutally honest sometimes because... Comedy is really just about someone being really honest about either their pain or their situation and being so ridiculous that we're all laughing at it. And then also not being afraid to, to kind of 
put yourself out there. You know, you don't want to necessarily play it safe because, you know, bigger is always better when it comes to comedy. But I really think that the most important thing is kind of bringing it all together with the punchline and having that punchline in some way, shape or form, not being um, super abrasive to the audience that you're speaking to or about the audience that you're speaking about, but being in a way where they can feel at the end, like, oh yeah, I'm in on this joke too. Even though the joke might've been about me the whole time, I'm in on it at the end. So you want that camaraderie feeling. Right. But you also want to showcase your talents and abilities and your range in a monologue. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of the monologues that I've written are for that purpose. Like in this, in this case, it was very specific. It showcases the range of being able to be extremely vocally, um, sort of uh, irate, bringing it on down to calmness. It shows different voices that you can do and shows us the range because a lot of a lot of things in our community is about how you have your work voice and then you have your play voice. And so it's important for you to show both of those. I have a lot of other monologues that I've written that also allow people to utilize their singing or their different accents. And so I think that that's always important and it makes it a good seller is because if I'm an actor, I want to showcase in these two minutes as much as possible about my type and about my range and about my comedic timing. So thinking of all those things. And I also think that, you know, you don't necessarily have to be a writer or actor to be a good writer, but to think like an actor and think like a performer when you're writing is always a plus. Right. Because you know what you need, you know, the elements Mm -hmm. that you need. Exactly. On that note, we need to take a break and hear from our sponsor, but we are talking to Elisa Murray and we will be right back. Looking for the perfect monologue that will nail your next audition? Need something right away? Need a fresh perspective? Monologues2go.com is your one-stop shop for audition material. We understand actors' needs because we've been in your shoes. We know the importance of finding the perfect piece that fits like it was made for you. Pick your favorite monologues and download them instantly. It's that easy. Think of us like a takeout menu, only a whole lot more fun. We're fresh, fast, hot, and delivered to you in seconds. Monologues to go.com. Original monologues that work. We are back with Elisa Murray. And Elisa, thank you for your insights about monologues. I just think that this is so helpful for, especially for the young actor who's coming up, they're a little lost as to what material makes a mm-hmm. really good vehicle for them. Because really, you said it just before we took our break. You said you've got two minutes to show pretty much everything you can do. Go. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you have to really um, leave an impression also in in such a short period of time. Right. You mentioned that you wrote it for yourself, that you had a really good experience. You got agent representation using it. Did you ever have a situation where a casting director or an agent said, oh, I don't like it when people write their own material? Yeah, I mean, I think that whenever you're at a monologue competition, there's always the uh, question of, where's your piece from before you perform? And a lot of times you'll get the, oh, I wrote it myself. And you'll see the body language of the judges who are usually a representation of some sort, you know, assuming like, okay, so now I'm not only judging you as a talent, I'm also judging you as a writer. Because if your monologue for some reason doesn't make sense, isn't funny, doesn't have a punch, I can no longer just look at it as, your performance solely. I'm looking at it as, well, you chose to put your writing on the forefront for this moment. And if it's not good, you know, it's kind of like I'm judging you doubly. So I think that that's a lot of the fear of performing your own piece, because I have seen in some monologue competitions or, you know, showcases where sometimes it will fall flat. And if you're a writer yourself, it's kind of hard for you to separate yourself from your work because you think your work is the best work right. ever and it's the funniest thing ever. And sometimes it doesn't relate that way. Um, I, I do think that I wouldn't say it's an hindrance because nowadays it's all about content creation. It's all about creating your own. Um, I do see that there's been a complete fluctuation in the industry where you have different creators like Issa Rae, um, just to name one, for example, who has come from a YouTube background to an HBO show and it's based off her own creation. So now I do feel like your representation is applauding you for creating your own content. Whereas maybe 
prior to that being the norm, it wasn't so much applauded. And you really actually had to have a, a really well-written monologue or else you would have been doubly judged, like I said, for not getting the audience response. And they would have blamed not only your acting, but your writing probably for the forefront. Like, oh, they might have been good if they did a monologue that was actually funny, you know, and, and you, you didn't want to have that sort of pressure on you. But I'm glad that it didn't stop people from actually doing their own work. It didn't stop me. Um, not every monologue that you write is going to have the best the best response. All you can really do is have, you know, someone that you can kind of go back with, bounce back with, show it to in advance before you perform, of course, get some responses before you're actually putting it in front of someone that has the ability to either further your career or not further your career because you just want to make sure that it is it is relating to the audience period because sometimes like I said as a writer it is hard for you to not love your own work whether it's good or not you love it because you, you worked on it right but I, I I love how the industry is changing I love how it's applauding now um, I noticed with my representation they love that I write they love that I'm consistently working on something, it is better for your sense of mind as an actor in between gigs to just be working on stuff, whether it ends up being pitched or placed or whatever, just knowing that I've written something, I've done a sketch, I've taped it myself, you know, all of these things. I've posted on social media, a monologue uh, that I've performed, that I wrote. All of these things make you look like you're consistently working and, and, and ready to work. And so I, I, I think it's, it could have definitely been something that was a negative before, and a hindrance, but I don't think that it's a negative now, in my personal opinion. Right, as the world changes mm -hmm. and the industry evolves. That being said, if writing isn't your strong suit, there's nothing wrong with buying a monologue from someone else or doing a monologue from a classic play. I mean, that's always a good idea. Absolutely. I mean, the classic plays are there because they're classics. And a lot of the classic plays are heavily performed, you know, so there is a lot of references. And it's always interesting when I see someone perform something that I've seen performed time and time again in a different way. And which is why I do like um, monologues to go specifically, because I do feel like those monologues are a little bit, um, they're popular, but they're not overly done. If you know, if you know what I mean, there's certain classic plays that you see someone pull a monologue out of all the time. And if I'm a representation, I've probably seen it performed on Broadway by a great already. So I'm comparing you instantly to whoever that is. Um, so it's a lot of pressure when you're doing a monologue that's, you know, for example, some of the monologues for monologues to go, they get performed a lot, but it's not the same platform as like something from like A Raisin in the Sun or something like that, or a Macbeth, where you might have seen that in your lifetime, you know, 50 times over. I do think it gives you a lot of chance to choose something that is very specific to you without having to deal with the pressure of, is my writing funny? Because you already know that they're tried and true time and time again, and they've already been used for competition. They've already won competition. So really all you have to do is focus on as an actor, you bringing your light to it and you bringing your own um, self to it and making it funny in your own way. And I think that when you're a writer and an actor, it, when you get your monologue, you, you're so attached to it that it is sometimes hard for you to hear the critique of, oh, maybe you should cut that out. Or oh, you probably don't need that. Like you want every single word you wrote, you wrote in there. That's, that's, a, that's how, how a writer thinks. And so it is hard to separate it. So sometimes it just is, look, you want to get out there, you want to get a good monologue performance for a competition or get you an a agent. You might just want to take one that you know is already tried and true that's not overrun, that they maybe don't recognize as soon as you say the first word, so they're not immediately judging you. And then you can really use, an, you can really give them an amazing um, perception and um, memory of your performance because it is so unique to you. So, I mean, I, I, I do see the benefit in definitely purchasing the monologues versus, versus writing them. I see the benefit in writing them. It just depends on what your, your strengths are. But I mean, I, I like that monologues to go exist because you know, before it did, I felt like you had no option but to write your own if you wanted it to be extremely specific in some cases. And now you have a whole database of very specific monologues for your type that you can just go and, gra and grab. Right. This makes it easier. Right. And you have actually expanded your writing 
from monologues, you've now moved into screenplays. Yes, I have. I actually, um, it's actually very new for me. I've been writing for about a year. I went to Sundance last year. I'm, I'm actually about to go again in a couple of days, but I was so inspired there because I met a lot of um, writers and directors and producers there and a lot of people that were working on films that, that haven't gotten any sort of acclaim yet. They haven't gotten any sort of eyeballs yet and they go to Sundance pitching and it's it's a really big networking event where you have a lot of creators coming together and saying I have these ideas and then to kind of see a film go from the process of writing all the way to the process of being in the theaters for example sorry to bother you director and written by Boots Riley I met him at Sundance last year um, just at a local party and he was just telling me about uh, his process of how he's like I started writing this idea just started you know putting it out there, something that was weird and different. It was my first attempt at writing. And then next thing you know, we leave Sundance. And then he has a seven figure deal with Anna Perina Films. Now he's, you know, up for nominations. And that that film did amazing with Lakeith Stanfield and Tessa Thompson. And so I looked at that process and I was just like, well, I didn't do that. And so I went with a group of people to Sundance and we all decided there to start putting together a film. And that's how Trapped came about. We wrote it as a group. Um, started the treatment at Sundance and then um, with the whole perception that we would be pitching it for the next year at Sundance. And then from there, it kind of snowballed into a lot of different things. Um, Coasting came about when I moved to LA. I had a very difficult transition, which I thought, let me make this funny because this Uh is, you know, life is not hilarious right now. It's very hard, you know, in some cases when you're moving across country on a whim for your dream. And so I thought, I want people to know about the real LA and not just the LA that is advertised as being so glamorous, you know, so they don't feel so intimidated about moving here. So they know what it's really like. And then from there, in the name of the father is the one I'm actually going to Sundance with this year to pitch is my first attempt at writing um, completely on my own without any sort of team behind me. So it's like, I've just been writing consistently since then. I'm very interested to see kind of what goes about it. I, I'm very new to the, the pitching process. I've only pitched a few of my films so far. Um, this will be my first Sundance with my own film, but it, it was, it was very inspiring just to see how a lot of these writers were first time writers right. and they just put themselves out there. So it's definitely, it's, it's a different art form from the monologues, but the monologues definitely were something that inspired me to continue this writing process for certain. And it's, it's a good way to kind of get started. If you are thinking about writing something more long form to start with these smaller, you know, either sketches or smaller um, monologues, two minute monologues, so you can really formulate a character. And then you never know from these monologues, you might formulate a character for a whole entire pilot. But I mean, I just think that writing is, is just so important for any performer, um, especially nowadays, it fuels everything you do. And it keeps you It just keeps you focused in between jobs. It keeps you feeling like you're a part of it. And it, you know, you you, you just never know where these things will end up. There's so much content that people are looking for nowadays from these young writers. And and your idea that you've been kind of sitting on could end up being the next great HBO show or the next great whatever. (laughs) So I'm always encouraging people to put themselves out there for certain. Well, congratulations to you for putting yourself out there. Sundance is fantastic. I mean, what an opportunity and what a great experience and the people that you're going to meet every time you go there. Yeah, it is. It's very fun. I didn't expect it to be so open. They really are looking for new ideas all the time. And that's what I did notice by becoming involved in a lot of these uh, writing communities is that it is really an open forum. And if you're if you're confident and you're putting your work out there and you're consistent, they're, they're looking for you. And so it just, it kind of took away that whole element of fear. It was a long time for me between writing the monologues and then transitioning to screenplays. And, you know, that was life, but I also think it was a lot of fear. But if I look back to Elisa at age 10, age eight, when I was thinking about what I wanted, it was always to perform pieces that I written that represent me. And so Angry Black Woman was the first attempt at that and to see that transform to whole pieces or whole pilots um, that have characters that represent me and represent what I've gone through in life. Um, it's, it's, it's so empowering because I feel like whether I'm on the silver screen yet or not, have awards yet or not, you know, all that's coming, I, I already feel so accomplished 
as a, as a creator. That's you know? very good. As a creator, that's what you keep doing is creating. And that's what keeps you fresh. And that's what keeps you motivated. And that's what keeps your art moving forward, whether you're writing or you're acting. And I just do want to mention, because we've been speaking a lot about your writing, but you have been out there. You were just this week, you spent a whole week on set on a very top secret movie that we will not speak yeah. about <laughs> because we can't but you are out there in all sorts of ways creatively and it's just wonderful because it as you said one feeds the other it does it does I will say I've been I've had an amazing um couple of years I've been out in LA for two years at this point um I do have a film coming out on the 23rd called Education of a Negro I'm very excited about that screening, that'll be my first major feature that I'm the lead in. And I will say that none of those things come about if I wasn't consistently working on my writing and just performing different monologues. Like I used to do a thing called Monologue Mondays, um, where I would take um, different monologues. Some of them were from Monologues to Go. Some of them were from other places. And every Monday, I would just post on social media a video of me doing a monologue. And you never know nowadays who is going to end up seeing your social media. And that leads you to a lot of auditions. Like there's so many different ways nowadays where you can lead yourselves to these agents because everything is so interconnected. Right. But if, you know, if I wasn't consistently performing, then you get a little stagnant and you get a little, oh, why am I not getting booked? And so I, for me, it was very important for me to never feel like that. So even just performing monologues from Monologues to Go and just putting them up on my social media and just having a response and maybe it turning into an audition, that was still crucial. Everything you do or you can be doing for yourself is crucial because you want to be seen as an actor or a performer that is always working. And whether the work is something that you're getting paid for by a major studio or something that you're doing in your own home, it still is showing the same message is that I'm always working. So I, I mean, I encourage everyone, you know, go on monologues to go right now, buy a monologue and then just perform it yourself, set up a scene, put it out there, make it consistent. I got, I got a lot of auditions from just doing that, just really? putting my monologues out there. Yeah. That's really great to know. I was, that was going to be my follow-up question was, did you get work out of it or did you get leads out of it? And you did. And it doesn't have to be a fancy camera. It can be right on your iPhone and putting it on a social media platform is fabulous. Yeah. And it's good practice because I, what I did notice, and I'm not sure if this is a new industry standard in, a, in New York as well, but I, I would assume it's across the board because LA usually sets the standard first and it trickles down to everywhere else. It, it's way more self-tape auditions now than... Um, coming in person. Yes. So they're looking for any images of you that you put out there yourself. A lot of times that can get you in the door and get you to that actual in-person audition a lot faster than if you don't put yourself out there. And it's also just good practice because when, when it does come around where you do have to put yourself on tape to that next level where you're getting in the room to be seen face to face to do that monologue face to face in front of that, you know, casting director, you have to you have to have a sense of how to tape yourself and that's practice. It's, you know, it sounds really easy, but there's a lot of factors into it that uh, maybe aren't necessarily what you would think about. And so it's good to constantly practice on your own, you know, so that when it does come about where you have that audition, it's like, Oh, can you put yourself on tape real quick? And we'll decide if we want to bring you in from there. You're already a pro at it. Right. Hone your craft. Yeah, exactly. Wonderful. Alisa, we are at our time, so I'm going to have to sign off, but okay. I'm so <laughs> thrilled that you agreed to come on the show and that you agreed to read your monologue and talk about your work, and I do have to say, your writing chops are really strong, and I wish you all the best in all of these independent projects that you are creating yourself. I admire entrepreneurs very much, but it's not just your entrepreneurial spirit. You really have the chops, and I have enjoyed watching your career blossom so far, and I can't wait to see what is next for you. Yeah, and I just appreciate you for giving me this opportunity to speak. Forgive me the opportunity even to write in the first place, because honestly, I probably would have never picked up a pen if I didn't know that there was a platform that existed really? in Monologues to Go for me to actually put the monologues out there. Yeah, I, I probably wouldn't have. And it was something I've always wanted to do, but it was a lot of fear. You know, it's a lot of fear putting yourself out there. So just thank you for even having the platform that exists 
and um, for giving me an opportunity to showcase my work. And then also for, you know, giving me an opportunity to kind of put it out there to people. And I'm just glad that it's been able to affect so many things and touch so many people in such a positive way. Well, I thank you. That's humbling. You have been listening to The Craft and Biz of Acting. I'm Joyce Story. Until next time, break a leg. Thanks for tuning in to The Craft and Biz of Acting. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And while you're at it, please leave us a rating and a review and share our show with your friends. We're building a supportive and educational community, and we want you to be a part of it. Tune in every week for more helpful insights and tools for honing your craft and booking your next gig. Until next time, break a leg.